again. Welcome back to our third Facebook Live um, session, where today we are based in the Department of English and Creative Writing at Lancaster University. So a quick recap, I'm Jess from Hello Future. Um, we've got Mike sort of in the background who's looking at your questions, we'll send them through. And we've got um, another Michael here, Michael Greeny, um, from the Department of English and Creative Writing. Uh, Michael, do you like to tell us a bit about your role here and what you do? Sure, yes, yeah. so I am a senior lecturer in English Literature and have been um, in this department for over 20 years because I was a research student here in the 1990s, I became a member of staff in 2000 and I, my responsibility is to teach literature of the 19th, uh, 20th century, contemporary literature, I teach critical theory and I've also recently become tutor for admission so I've got a sort of, a, my brief includes kind of outreach and admissions and everything associated with that side of it. Great, brilliant. So, um, yeah, we've got a great mind to pick here. So if you do have any questions about what it's like to apply for courses here or what it's like to study here or what things might look like after university, do send them in. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to ask similar questions to what we've been asking in the last two sessions. Um, and we're just going to ask them in no particular order. So shall we get started with the first one and see what comes up? So the first question um, I've got is, are there any work experience opportunities on the course or at the university itself? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are various ways in which a student in my department can build work experience mm -hmm. into the, the degree. So I think degree in English Literature lasts for three years. Uh, and what you can do, one option is to do what we call a, a school volunteering module, which would be to take a mm -hmm. term out of your third year in which you'd be placed in a school environment, you'd observe lessons, you'd help the teacher, and you'd work on projects with the students as well, mm -hmm. for example, on, with the pupils, for example, on storytelling or creating poetry, something where there's a kind of interface between what school-level um, pupils need and what you're interested in as a student of literature. Mm -hmm. So that's a kind of self-contained thing you can do. On a more ambitious level, something that's brand new at Lancaster University is a, a placement degree. Oh, okay. uh, and this is something that's sometimes known as a sandwich degree as well, nice. where you do, uh, rather than do a three-year degree, the third year of your degree is um, uh, a year in which you're placed with a business or a charity or another organisation, you work for them, mm. you get paid for a year, uh, you acquire all the, the skills, all the kind of transferable kind of accomplishments mm. you would acquire, and then you come back and you complete the fourth year of your degree. So you've okay. got that kind of real-world hands-on experience. Nice. And what kind of businesses has that been in the past for some students? Because it's brand new. Mm. I mean, it's, it's a kind of suck-it-and-see situation okay, at, nice. at the moment. Uh, and the onus is kind of on students when they come to be proactive and to seek out those links mm. and those opportunities, which could be Lancaster-based or regionally-based, but there's nothing to stop students who are perhaps from other parts of the country seeking out links and potential wow. opportunities elsewhere. So oh, it's, it's, we're kind of in a wait-and-see moment in terms yeah. of the stories that happen, but yeah, it's a great. kind of exciting innovation. Yeah, and it's a good chance for students to try new things and build some new connections as well. Yeah, get, getting out of the kind of maybe what you might see as the comfort zone Mm. Of, of the library and the seminar room into, oh, nice. into very different environments. Oh, brilliant. And for, um, you were talking about a, a module where students can look at teaching. Do they sort of get a choice of what years of teaching that is? Or primary, secondary, what does that look like? Yeah, we have, we have a network of relationships with different oh. schools in the region, including primary and secondary schools. So if you have a, a firm commitment that, you know, you see your future as a primary school teacher, mm. then obviously you would look for one of the primary school placements yeah. and, and, and vice versa. Oh, great. So they're contained up to, to what they're getting Absolutely. into. Nice one. Brilliant. So if you have just joined us, I have seen that we've got someone just has just joined us. Um, We've just been talking about what other work experience and placement opportunities um, on the course itself and in the university as well. So if you are watching this um, ahead of time, you can scroll back and see what that looks like. Um, but for now, we'll move on to our next question. So the next question we've got is, um, what are your previous students doing now and what successes have uh, previous alumni had? Okay, how long Broad have you got? Question. Yeah, <laughs> no. Um, a lot of things to reel off. I mean... There are certain, I, I guess, maybe what you might call traditional destinations for mm -hmm. English students, such as teaching, journalism, broadcasting, and so forth, where you can see a direct continuity between the skills and knowledge that you acquire studying literature and mm -hmm. the, the kind of professional skills that they're implementing. And obviously, a, a generous number of our students do that. Yeah. Um, I think perhaps what's less well known is the number of literature graduates who go into 
maybe commercial or retail or marketing environments that, that maybe seem as a bit, bit more of a sideways move. Mm. And a nice way of illustrating that is actually to think about our university, Lancaster University, some of the most senior people in this university. Uh, if I rattle through some titles, the Director of Governance, the mm -hmm. Director of Marketing, the Director of Commercial Services. The common denominator between all these people is that they are English literature graduates. Oh, really? So if the university is deciding, I don't know, do we want a Starbucks on campus? Are we going to open a KFC? The person who negotiates that, the Director mm -hmm. of Commercial Services, is, is someone who studied here and studied literature. So uh, there, are sort of, there are these kinds of maybe unexpected avenues yeah. that, that students can go down. And it's interesting to see how many unexpected avenues there are. Um, what do you think that students who apply to study English literature, um, should they have a clear idea of what they're doing after university, or do they seem to have a clear idea? What's um, I think it, it really de depends on individuals. Some individuals mm. have this kind of undeviating life mission from, from an early age, and, and some are more open and mm. flexible and my my response is that there is no right and wrong way to be yeah. when you're 13 or 16 or 18 that if you have a sense of mission and purpose that's fantastic but mm. if you are if you kind of feel like you you know you're not quite sure what the future holds for you uh, then I think doing doing a degree is is partly about acquiring knowledge but partly about acquiring a sense of who you are and what yeah. you're good at what you thrive at and my my kind of very, very broad career advice to, to people in, in, in life is, is, is find what, what you thrive at and what makes you happy yeah. and, and hopefully translate that into a sense of a career or a vocation in the longer term. Mm, yeah, that's really good advice, that. Um, I'll, I'll say for myself, for the future reference of this video, that I studied here myself um, in English and Creative Writing. Um, and I sort of like you've described there, I didn't really know too much what I wanted to do. I just knew I, I really enjoyed the subject. Um, and that led me into to this role, which... Um, takes into account some of those things we were talking about, marketing and sales, presentation and stuff. Um, so yeah, I think it's important to know what routes there are and how broad that can be as yeah. well. Brilliant. Um, so if you have just tuned in, we've just been talking about um, what future graduates might go on to do after studying uh, English literature and creative writing and what kind of sectors that they might go into. Um, but for now, we'll move on to our next question. Um, I'll see what's on this card here and the question is what do exams and assessments look like in your subject okay so in, in my in our department i would say that exams are almost an endangered species that they okay. are really dwindling in terms of the proportion of assessment that they account for in students experience over the three years of, of doing a degree and over, overwhelmingly i'd say the lion's share of assessment for mm an undergraduate student in this department will be uh, coursework. Uh, but coursework is, is, is covers quite a significant range of different activities, uh, essays, which can be anything from a thousand words up to, I guess there's a point where you would call them projects or dissertations mm. and they get to 4,000, 5,000 or 10,000 words. Portfolios, if you're working on creative writing. Yeah. Um, projects uh, and also um, oral assessments as well. So, mm. so some uh, there are some courses which will ask you to work collaboratively in groups and deliver deliver a presentation on the subject of your choice. Okay. So we try to kind of, I think, inject maximum variety into the assessment mm. experience. Uh, and I think we have a shared sense that exams have their place, but they are perhaps not the you know it should, they shouldn't be the exclusive mode whereby yeah. we assess people's knowledge of literature. Definitely. And I think a good follow-up to that would be to see, because um, a, a lot of our audience and the students that we work with will be studying their GCSEs or A-levels at the moment. How do you think those assessments might differ to what they're doing now? So they might do coursework and exams, but you're talking about projects and oral yes. assessments. How do you think that differs um, at university? Um, I think that there is continuity. I mm -hmm. think that, that the skills you acquire at GCSE level and A-level, it's not as though we're saying abandon everything you've yes, learned, that yeah, we, we want you to keep those skills, but what we will increasingly do is we will challenge you to be more autonomous, mm. uh, so uh, to, in, to, to in exercise greater freedom in terms of determining how you want to approach literature. So mm. typical uh, essay or assignment at O-level or A-level might say, write an essay on this particular character in this particular novel, so it yeah. will be very, very directive 
and the assignment will have certain criteria that will reward certain information and certain approaches that students mm -hmm. are expected to have absorbed. As you go through degree level study of English literature, increasingly stu um, students will be asked to set their own topics or to set their own titles. Okay. Uh, so a dissertation, for example, is a 10,000 word piece of research in which the student chooses an author, chooses a topic, chooses an approach, mm -hmm. uh, gets supervision and guidance and encouragement from us, but it is in a way a solo mission, one in which people can demonstrate they've got the kind of credentials and they've got the skills mm -hmm. to to guide themselves rather than be guided and steered okay. by others through their, their knowledge of literature. Nice, so a lot more freedom then. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think that's freedom is the watchword. Yeah, so, yeah. Yes. Oh great, it's nice to know that they can move on from um, you know, write about Curly's wife and of mice, when that's always the popular one, and then <laughs> taking that on and see, seeing how much more you can explore in that too. Absolutely. Get to know. Great, so if anyone new has just joined us, I'll just scroll through Facebook. We've just been chatting about what assessments look like um, in the Department of English and Creative Writing at Lancaster University. Um, so if you'd like to know more about those, um, you can go to the Lancaster website, which is www.lancaster.ac.uk, and you can find out a bit more um, about what um, modules there are in the course and what assessments might look like. Um, so I'll put all these links in the comments below after this video. Um, but for now, we'll move on to the next question. So the next question we have is, um, and we've already had some good advice, so we'll see if this is the same. Um, what advice would you give to young people studying their GCSEs who are unsure what they'd like to study in the future? Um, one thing I'd say is, is don't necessarily be worried about uncertainty. Mm. That uncertainty isn't, isn't a character flaw, you yeah. know. Um, and... To, I mean, I suppose, at, at the risk of repeating myself, I, I would tend to advise people to, to think about what they love doing. What makes you happy? Because if you if you like doing something, you will invest in it. Yeah. Uh, you will then likely get rewarded for, for the investment, and then there will be a kind of virtuous circle where getting good marks, good feedback, encouraging wor words from, from tutors and teachers and so forth, mm. will create a kind of virtuous circle yeah. where you will then continue to invest even more. So I think following enthusiasm, following curiosity about what you know, what in life are you, do you want to know more about? Mm. Very broad advice, but that I think is the kind of advice that I'd want to give people. Yeah, and there's a similar theme there that we've found in the other Facebook Live sessions about following it is following what it is you're interested in um, and how you can work hard at that and it's really interesting. And something I've enjoyed asking as a follow-up to this is, how did you know that this was a subject you were interested in, and how, how did you get into the subject yourself? That's <laughs> <laughs> a tricky question. Um, well, I, I mean, I can actually, I, it's something I kind of, I do find myself thinking about. Yeah. With a, with a, with a lot, of, I think, as probably with a lot of people like myself, it was it was an inspirational teacher at the right time. Yes. So, yeah. uh, I, I'm old enough to have done GCE rather than GCSE, <laughs> uh, uh, English Literature, and I remember we did Shakespeare, we did Julius Caesar, yeah. and I remember a particular class where we were discussing uh, Mark Antony's funeral speech in Julius Caesar, in which he, he says that Brutus, Brutus is one of the, the friends of Caesar who assassinates him, and he says Brutus is an honourable man. Uh, and our teacher said, is, is he being sarcastic or not when he says honourable? And we had a bit of a go-round, and there were different mm. points of view, and then we turned to the teacher and said, so, so which is it? Is, is? And the teacher said, I don't know. <laughs> and I thought at that point, that kind of openness, I found very exciting. Yeah. The idea that there is a um, an ongoing critical debate mm. where you can have different points of view that have to battle it out using evidence, using arguments, yeah. rather than some kind of preordained truth that you somehow have to sort of absorb un unquestionably. I think that openness to, to critical debate is something that I, I took from that experience and increasingly I think define my relationship with literature so, yeah. so I think there was a bit of a light bulb moment in that yeah. class all those years ago. Yeah. It's always when you look back on it that you identify those moments yeah. and realise you know it led you to all this. Wow so um, if anyone new has just joined us we've just been chatting about um, the advice that, that um, Michael would give to GCSE students who are maybe um, a bit confused about what they might study in the future and um, so there's some uh, great advice there so do scroll back if you are watching after the live event. Um, for now, we'll move on to another question. I don't know if this is another advice question, but we'll see. Oh, here we go. So, 
what current research is taking place in your department and how does that impact the course? Okay, I mean, again, um, I could talk for a long yes. time about this. Yeah, I imagine. Uh, I mean, I, it's probably worth maybe saying a few words about what research is. Because yeah, that's, yeah, definitely. Because um, that's something that everyone in my department has a kind of broad knowledge of, of literature mm -hmm. and, and could probably teach across different periods and different authors and different styles of literature. Yeah. But what we also, all of us, have is some kind of niche, some kind of specialist area that we are trying to acquire expertise in. Um, mm -hmm. And that could be the work of a particular author, it could be a particular period such as Victorian literature or Renaissance literature, or it could be a particular genre or style such okay. as Gothic or science fiction. And we all of us have these pet projects. Mm. Um, and one way in which these pet projects feed into the teaching experience is that we run uh, optional modules that very much reflect what we're working on right now. Sure. So a couple of examples that I guess spring to mind. One is mm. um, one of my colleagues who uh, I think really has a really interesting and enviable research mm. area is Professor Kathleen Spooner who okay. is an expert in, in Gothic, mm. uh, Gothic literature and culture. So anything to do with vampires, ghosts, spectres, ghouls, mm -hmm. the uncanny, she's got it covered. Wow. And, and she is internationally preeminent in the field to the extent where uh, she recently showed me a translation of one of her books that's just been translated into Japanese. Oh, wow. So I was, I was very, very in awe when yeah. I saw that. Uh, and what, um, what our undergraduates can do if they're into Gothic, and many, many people are, in the third year is sign up for Goth uh, Catherine's module on Victorian Gothic. Mm. So kind of ghost stories and horror stories by people like Robert Louis Stevenson uh, and Bram Stoker for, for, from the 19th century. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's an example, I guess, of, a, of a, an entire genre mm. of Gothic. Uh, things could be more specific. So I'm currently in the very, very, very early stages of writing a book on Jane Austen. Okay. Um, and I've launched a, a, a module on Jane Austen, a 10-week specialist module in which we read her her major works and someone once said to me and I, I very much agree with this a wise old professor he said um, you don't know you understand something until you know you can teach it mm. so being able to explain something to other people so for example I know someone said to me uh, explain Brexit negotiations I, would, I wouldn't be able to do it I don't yeah. understand it um, so it's a way of consolidating in your own mind your ideas about a given author so I've been I've had this in a way a privilege this term of being able to turn up on a Friday morning and uh, get discussions about Jane Austen going and say, I've got this theory about gifts in Jane Austen, I've got this hunch about friendship in Jane Austen, mm. what do you think, what do you think? And then getting feedback, questions, comments, disagreements. Yeah. And, and it's just, as I say, it's a privilege because you get to hone your ideas in, in a friendly, but sometimes kind of ch you know challenging context. And, yeah. and, and, and so that we get something out of it as, as lecturers and students, what they get the benefit of is, is research which is, we hope, state of the art and, and cutting edge. Yeah, and it's, that's good to know that it's um, very, it's quite refreshed and it's quite up, up to date, which is good. Um, and you've talked about how everyone seems to have a specialism in, in lots of different things, whether it's an author, a genre or um, a particular time period. Um, is that limited to just books itself? What about different forms of, of media? What does that look like on the course? That, yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Mm. We, I mean, our department has quite a kind of open and liberal view of what counts as as literature. And the term mm. that people often use is they'll talk about texts. Yeah. And a text is, I mean, it's quite a useful term because a text can be a poem, it can be a play, it can be a novel, it could be a newspaper, but it could also be a film script or, 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 or a video game. Mm. So, so anything that tells a story, uses language, communicates in terms of narrative, uh, we, we see as, as, as a kind of open discipline, a discipline mm. that in a way has fuzzy edges, and we're interested in those, those fuzzy edges and, and, and sort of expanding the discipline yeah. in an inclusive way. So we have a, a course on literature and film, mm. uh, which is taught by my colleague, uh, Professor Camilla Elliott, who has written one of the definitive studies on what's at stake when you turn a book into a film, mm. what do you lose and what do you gain when you convert Romeo and Juliet or Jekyll and Hyde from a, from a text into something that's happening on a screen. Mm. Um, and that interest in, I guess in modern technology and cinema and so forth, 
we're trying to push that even further and think, okay, what about what about podcasts? What about yeah. blogs? What about the new media? So those are all areas of which are state of the art, which is sort of changing in front of our very eyes. Mm. And the department tries to keep it, rather than sort of, I guess, getting stuck in the past, tries to, to be constantly open to the way in which the new media are renewing and extending yeah. a whole understanding of what literature is. Yeah. Wow. It's really good to know just the scope of everything here and how you know students can maybe look at this now and just um, see if, if they do, do come and join them here. They've got such a range of uh, texts to study and such a range of um, specialisms and, and people to chat to about that. So that's really good to hear, hear a bit about that. Um, I imagine it's, it's a lot to cover in, in one Facebook Live, but that's, that's great. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I'll give Michael a break now um, <laughs> and give you a chance to hear a little bit about Lancaster University Open Days that are coming up. Um, so I'm just making sure um, that we mention these because uh, it's a really great chance to see the university itself. You can see it through Facebook Live, but you get a much better experience when you're here. Um, so the Open Days coming up are in summer, and there's one on the 29th of June, the 13th of July, and then there's two in September, so that's the 7th and 14th. Um, and these are uh, just a really good chance to, to meet current students um, and to hopefully go to some talks um, about any subjects that you're interested in. I'd be interested to see, Michael, what do you think, uh, why do you think that students should go to an open day, just any university open day, what are your thoughts? Um, I think it's to get a sense of the, the word that springs to mind is vibe, which I know yeah. is a slightly <laughs> colloquial way of putting it, the kind of atmosphere and the feeling of the place, because yeah. you can... Um, you can find out an awful lot online, can't you? And you can yeah. look at league tables and rankings and so forth. And, and I think that's an important part of the, kind of the mm -hmm. detective work that students do when they decide where they would like to attend university. But what that can't convey is that sense of, of whether you feel at home at yeah. the university. If you do go to open days as well, you'll talk to people like me mm -hmm. who will obviously sing the praises of the university and say it's great and it's wonderful, which of course it is, mm -hmm. but you'll also hopefully get to talk to students as well who will yeah. give you the, the student's eye view of what it's like to, to be there, but also spending time having, having a cup of coffee, nosing around the library, getting a sense of whether you can project yourself into this environment in mm -hmm. one year, two years, three years' time. Uh, I think that there's no substitute really for, for that kind of uh, hands-on, I suppose, encounter with, mm. with, with the kind of the, the campus and the people and the environment. I think it's really valuable. Yeah, definitely. And a lot of people have talked about um, that differentiation between being able to do that research online and, and seeing all the information there, but as you said, going here and seeing the vibes of it. <laughs> so yeah, I think everyone seems to have that, that view, which is um, yeah, it's a good point to make. Um, great, so if you have just joined us, we've just been chatting about um, the Lancaster University Open Days that are coming up. You can find more um, about those and how you can get involved at www.lancaster.ac.uk slash study slash open days. Um, and as I say, I will put these links in the comments box below. Um, but for now, we'll get back to the questions. Um, the next question we've got for you is, um, how competitive is the application process to your subject? I mean, that, I think that sort of will depend on, it will differ from university to university. Yeah. So speaking in relation to Lancaster, um, our, um, our requirement is an A at uh, A-level for English literature. So it's, mm -hmm. we, we do set the bar quite high. Yeah. Um, and having said that, I do think it's important for students to recognise that it can feel like a challenging process applying for university mm. and meeting those standards and, and qualifying, and, and, and clearly it is in all sorts of ways. But I think it's sort of healthy to look at it from the other point of view, which is that there's another competition going on between universities, is universities are competing with each other to yeah. get the best students. We want the, yeah. the brightest and most talented and promising to come to Lancaster and not mm. to X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, you know, don't think of yourself as someone who is simply trying to please and impress us, also think, actually, I'm a promising, promising and talented student, mm. and I want these places to impress me. I want them to show me what they've got, what qualities they have, mm, to make me want to, to commit to applying here rather than there. So I think yeah. that, that kind of degree of kind of sense of your own value, I think, is, is quite a healthy part of the, the application process. Yeah, I think that's a good way of looking at it, um, 
about students seeing what what university what universities can give to them as well. Um, I suppose a good question to follow up from that would be um, thinking about students maybe who are looking into what courses they might want to study. What would you advise to them to do to explore more into that subject or to I don't know gain some enthusiasm enthusiasm about that subject or see if it's for them? What what advice would you give to them or what can yeah. they do? To so you mean like someone who perhaps hasn't decided whether it's going to be English or history? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that there there are I suppose traditional things you can do and perhaps more kind of state of the art things you can do, but. I think with the, 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 the traditional side of things, it's talk, talk to teachers, talk to kind of sixth form tutors or, or heads of subject and, and, and say to them, what, what should I read to get a flavour of what it would be like to be a history undergraduate or an English undergraduate? Are there, are there books that would suddenly come on my radar then that are not on my radar now? So, yeah. um, I, I mean, there, there are kind of, there's a, almost a genre in itself in, in relation to literature, of books called things like this one called Doing English by Robert Eagleston. Robert Eagleston is a very distinguished professor of literature at the University of London, but has written a book which is tries to hit that sweet spot of um, junior undergraduates, uh, sixth formers, perhaps even you know ambitious C uh, GCSE students, yeah. who just want to have their eyes open to maybe a more ambitious and challenging mm. way of thinking about the subject. And I think they're probably equivalent to most other disciplines. And if you if you read books like that, then you'll you'll either be excited by those broader horizons, or perhaps not. Perhaps yeah. you might think, mm, well, maybe this isn't for me. Alongside that, I think it is it is about becoming more ambitious in your reading. So rather than thinking this is what I have to read for GCSE, this is what I have to read for A level, what can I add to that picture that will create a more comprehensive knowledge? So. Mm -hmm. Let's say they've asked you to read A Midsummer Night's Dream. You might think, OK, this is a Shakespeare comedy. I'm going to go and read Much Ado About Nothing and As You Like It as well. And that kind of initiative, I think, is valuable in all sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. It's always good to read Shakespeare. It's an end in itself. Uh, but also it will give you a sense of what it feels like to be an English literature undergraduate, which is that more kind of panoramic, panoramic and sweeping knowledge rather than the more, in a way, kind of intensive knowledge mm -hmm. that you get at school level. The other, I mean, when I mentioned more state-of-the-art things you can do, mm -hmm. um, something that I wish had existed when I was uh, an undergraduate and indeed a graduate student was just the kind of technology we have now. Yeah. So if you go online and you go onto YouTube and you're studying Othello, mm -hmm. you could put in Othello lecture, you will find lectures on Othello. Othello performance, you will find uh, films of Othello. There, there are ways, without even leaving your armchair, yeah. there are ways of just be getting a kind of broader knowledge of, of literature uh, and kind of tuning into the kind of debates about literature that go on at university level, uh, that, that hopefully there'll be exciting, inspiring stuff out there. And the same will apply for, for any discipline. Yeah, and a lot of those technologies, um, I know working with, with our young people in schools, are already so much in use now. Like um, YouTube, that's such a good way into you know, a bit of wider reading in a sense. Yes. Um, yeah, great. So there's some great advice there just about being ambitious in your reading now and just um, seeing seeing if that's an area of interest for you and that's a great way to, to see if this subject's for you. Um, great. So just as we were answering that last question there, a load of green notifications popped up, which means that we've got a couple new people joining us. Um, so I'll just give a quick recap of what we've been talking about. Um, we've just been chatting about what students could do now to see if um, English and creative writing is a subject for them. Um, but that's also some great advice um, that could apply to any subject, really, um, and see if that's for you. Um, as a little break now, I will um, just highlight here, I've got a good resource here on the table, which is the Piggy Bank Guide, um, which also has a website here, which is www.thepiggybank.org.uk. Um, and that's just for, for you guys to see um, what the finance side of university looks like um, and what finance looks like after school and for um, any sort of living skills that you've got. So do look at that as a useful resource um, because whilst we're talking about the subjects today, it's great to just see um, what the other side of university looks like when you're actually living it. Um, but brilliant, we haven't got any new questions coming in, so we'll go with what we've got here. Um, what we have is... And it's a little bit silly.
similar to what we've been talking about. Um, what do you look for in a personal statement? So, and a bit more specifically, what activities or opportunities can young people get involved in now um, to boost their subject interest? So we've kind of talked about you know, wider reading that they could do, um, or technologies they could, they could use. Is there any other sort of opportunities that you um, can think of? I guess, I mean, there are... I mean, there, it depends on sort of how much... Uh, of a, a sort of social experience you want to make it, but you know yeah. you could set up a book group, you know, with yeah. you and your friends, you know, and and it wouldn't have to necessarily be about reading, you know, incredibly difficult, daunting, high yeah. literature. It could be the the young adult fiction book group or, or the mm. science fiction book, but but something like that I think would be because ours is it's quite a sociable discipline I think because yeah. so much of the teaching is done. Uh, through discussion and, and mm. through interaction with, 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 with peers. So that would give you a kind of head start to something as simple as that. Um, you know, go, going to the theatre, or if you don't live near a theatre, going, going, going online onto um, you know, YouTube is, 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 is just a great way of experiencing yeah. dramatic texts being performed so they're not simply two-dimensional things on the page, but some yeah. things there, there, there in, in three and four dimensions. Mm. Um, I think... Broadening your reading I, is is something I would strongly encourage people to do. I could, I mean, I have memories of this process myself of, mm. of, of being a sixth former, and I remember being a bit intimidated by literature. Yeah. You know, the moment when you go into uh, Waterstones and you see the classics, and there yes. are rows on row. I mean, oh, there's Dickens, and there are the Brontes, yeah. and the Mrs. Gaskell, and there's Dante, and there's and and, and Tolstoy, and some of them are just gigantic and. Mm. I suppose all I would say is don't don't be daunted by it. Don't don't regard it as this kind of assault course yes. where you have to somehow <laughs> negotiate. Uh, but simply develop, find corners of literature that really speak to you and yeah. you dig more deeply into them. Um, find if there's an author you liked at GCSE or A level, read more of their text. Or mm. if there's a genre, if you've done detective fiction, if you've done dystopia, find more texts in that vein and dig and dig into them. So so it's, it's about, I think, as I say, following enthusiasm. Mm. With the personal statements, to answer your question about personal statements, yeah. I guess what I'd say is we're looking for personality. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking for a sense of, of who you are, which does make it slightly difficult to say, and here's, here is my menu of how yeah. you, because, because it has to come from uh, students, but don't over-egg the pudding. Uh, yeah. don't, don't, don't feel that you need to make extraordinarily extravagant claim, claims about your levels of mm. passion for, for, for literature. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's just about showing that you're, you have a commitment yes. and investment in literature, possibly but just by telling your story mm. about was there a particular book, or was there a particular moment when you knew you wanted to be a literature student or has it been a lifelong fascination with reading? Talk us through some of the books that, that you've studied that, yeah. that have inspired you and tell us maybe about, not, not simply about ones that, that you love, but mm. ones that you maybe you didn't get on with, but, yeah. but, but explain why. So if you, if you can show that you've got that kind of analytical and mm. thoughtful relationship with literature, I think that is, that is a really interesting and useful counterpoint to, to passion. Passion yeah. is great yeah. and with analysis. Um, and if you have space, I think a degree of sort of forward-looking as well. Some emphasis on what it is about university-level reading that you're looking forward to, to doing. So not just the story of my reading life to this point, but I'm looking forward to studying 18th century fiction. I've never mm. studied it before. I'm looking forward to, to finding out more about Victorian poetry. Whatever it might be, that's, that's a nice thing to hear, is that kind of open-mindedness yeah. about what's still to come can be as sort of persuasive as, as the enthusiastic account of, of what's already happened. Yeah, and I'm glad you sort of explained all that and, and about expressing your personality through that, because that, that fits in with the question that's come through now okay. um, from Rach, who has said, um, was there a specific book or play which inspired you to teach English? Um, I'd, I would say it was it was the cluster of books I did at GCSE and A level, okay. uh, which I could probably um, I could probably take those exams again now because really? they're okay. they're drilled into you yeah. at, at a tender and an impressionable age. I studied uh, Lord of the Flies, Julius okay. Caesar, uh, and the poetry of John Betjeman uh, and, and Charles Crawley and Ted Hume. So that, those okay. are my those are my 
uh, O-level texts. Mm. Um, whether I had the favourite amongst them, I don't know, but I think mm. it was the experience of, of debating them and realising that we didn't necessarily have to come to some kind of official consensus about our view on a particular character or a particular meaning, but that yeah. there was maybe a range of different ways, equally valid ways, of, of, of responding to them. So those yeah. were, those for me were, you know, I, I would still, I'd go back to them and happily read them now, so I felt lucky to, to, to have read them at the time. Yeah, and that sort of uh, links into what you, you were saying before about being in that classroom when you were discussing Julius Caesar, and I know there might be a few of our students who are um, studying Julius Caesar, and I don't think, um, yes, that's really relevant to hear. Um, a follow-up question from that, which has come through from Rachel, is... Uh, let's see, a few more. Uh, did you always know that you wanted to uh, teach English, um, or did you think um, you wanted to do something else when you were in your teens? Did you always have this clear career path in mind? No, I, 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 had, I didn't have the foggiest beyond a sort of dim sense that it would be nice to go to university, <laughs> yeah. uh, and that I was, uh, I was a slot at school. Okay. Uh, and and I, su I suppose if if you get positive feedback on something, as I was saying earlier, you tend to invest more in that. So yeah. so I get you know I, d I do pretty well in tests and exams. I'm like oh I, I like this. I'll you know uh, let's I'll do A level. I'll do uh, degree level uh, study of English. But there was there was a point where I was I had a kind of choice between English and maths as okay. as t two things that, that I liked doing and enjoyed doing uh, and. I mean absolutely no disrespect to my GCSE maths teacher, who was who was a very fine maths teacher, yeah. but it was it was that kind of experience of GCSE English literature that tilted me towards right. towards a more humanities mm. uh, focused approach to to, to to my study, and then and then teaching is something that um, I did a, a PhD in English literature, which involved uh, four years of studying a, a writer called Joseph Conrad mm. uh, in in in, in uh, excruciating detail. Uh, and doing some tutoring on the side because mm. uh, that's nearly everyone who's who does a PhD these days will get a bit of teaching experience, um, and and that's how it started really is is just as something which accumulated and accumulated. So yeah. I, there was never a a sense of vocation at an early age, but something that I kind of found myself doing and increasingly enjoying. Mm. Um, so it's di it's different for everyone, but that's certainly that's my yeah. that's my story. Yeah, there are definitely those moments when you start, start, start to edge towards a certain subject, but I realise that's some, something to be you. Um, great, so if anyone has just um, scrolled through and join us, we've just been talking about um, sort of some interesting questions about um, Michael's specific, in specific interests, so uh, what books or plays um, inspired you to, to get into English, um, but also, you know, did, did you know this was a subject for you? So if you'd like to scroll back and find that, um, you can if you're watching this later. Um, but for now, I think we've got one last question in the pot, and we'll see what that is. Okay, so, um, what subjects would you expect applicants to study? So this is sort of when they're at their A-levels, applying to university, um, what subjects are you expecting to? I mean, it's, it's quite a straightforward answer yeah. from, from this department, uh, an A-level in English Literature, mm -hmm. or, or an equivalent baccalaureate or, or similar type yeah. of qualification, is, is the only stipulation. Great. Um, okay. So once upon a time here, I mean, it may well be the case at other universities, there may be requirements, for example, uh, a, a European language at GCSC or something along those lines. Okay. We, we don't have that expectation. And my, I mean, my, my sense is that all, it, so long as you've got that advanced qualification in mm -hmm. English literature and, and study to an advanced level in other courses, yeah. I don't mind if you have a kind of humanities background, if you've done English or French or whatever. Or if you've done something that's more of a mix of humanities and sciences, yeah. because you'll you'll have had those study skills, you'll have passed those exams, and you'll you'll have proved yourself, and, okay. and you'll be ready to study at uh, at university level. Great. So that that was quite a simple question with a direct answer, which sure. is brilliant. Um, great. I will uh, direct you to the Lancaster website where you can find out much more about um, the courses um, and what what are available and what what the requirements are. For each of those, so that's www.lancaster.ac.uk. That's a mouthful to say. Um, as I've read that, another question's just come in, um, and it's sort of similar to your own experiences again. So, um, how did you choose where to go for university, um, and what would you, what advice would you give to some to someone who doesn't know where they would like to study? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. 
I'll start, shall I start with the second, yeah. uh, the second yeah. part of that question? Because I, I think that there are, you can think about ideal world considerations and then mm. real world considerations. And real world considerations will be different for everyone. It will be how far or near, for example, can I travel? How far or near do I want to yeah. be, for, for example, from friends and family? And different people will have different levels of freedom to, to, to move away or to, to stay closer to home. So that, that's, that's something that obviously can... Is, is a decision that will be made by, by, by individuals. Yeah. Um, my advice to people is to just spend some time digging around on websites and getting a feel for whether the courses that universities offer cater to your enthusiasms, whether okay. this, is a, this is a place that you, you would be excited and stimulated and supported if mm. you were to go and, um, and, 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 and study there. Uh, and to follow up, as I've already said, to follow up ideally with, with a, a visit to, to the university itself, yeah. to be able to look the people in the eye, uh, and, and, but also to, to just kind of inhale the atmosphere or the vibe, as we've called it, and get a feel for whether you, you would be at home there or not. Yeah. Um, my own experience, the university that I went to as an undergraduate, very much was determined, I, and again it's something I realised in retrospect, it, it, was, it came down to an open day. Where I met members of staff and I was shown around by one of their, I think, a second year undergraduate, who at the time seemed incredibly old and mature and, and, mm. and grown up, uh, but was also friendly, down to earth, had this kind of genuine and unaffected enthusiasm for the place, seemed completely at home. And I kind of thought, well, I can, he just seems like you know, the kind of person. If he's having a good time here and fits in, then I can imagine myself here. Yeah. So that that one visit, looking back, was a decisive turning point yeah. in my life in, ter in, in terms of where I ended up for three years. Wow. So they are very kind of um, they can be very significant days. Open yeah. Days in terms of those decisions. Yeah, and a another one of those light bulb moments. Yes. Really. Wow. Um, great. So we've just been chatting a little bit about uh, how to choose where you might want to study. Um, and one thing I will mention is if you're watching um, from one of the schools in Cumbria, I know that you've got a, a bank of resources at school, whether it's um, a, a massive library of prospectuses to look around. Um, so I know some schools are using Unifrog, um, but also we've got technology at our hands now. So um, as Michael was saying, sort of use, use what's out there really to explore what, um, what courses there are out there and what universities um, provide your, for your enthusiasm and what you're looking for. Brilliant. Um, that's come to the end of our questions. Um, I know uh, that was the last question that was asked, so it's maybe a good chance to sort of round things off. Um, I'd like to thank Michael very much for coming along and answering questions. It's been great to um, have all your skills and experience shared with us all. Um, and if you have got any further questions after this, do comment below um, and we'll, we'll see how we can answer those. Um, but yeah, do you have any last last comments to say or anything? Um, I just questions? invite anyone who, who's... who's uh, watching this, if you mm -hmm. want to find out anything more about Lancaster University, uh, either the Department of English Literature and Creative Writing or the university as a whole, uh, please visit our website and get, get in touch. Brilliant, yes. And as I say, all those links will be down below. Um, and we'll see you tomorrow for another Facebook Live um, all about marketing and what, that, what that's like. So thank you very much and see you later. <laughs> Bye.